We're here with uh, Stephanie Stilson. Stephanie, tell us uh, what your roles and responsibilities have been since uh, the end of the shuttle's flying day. Sure. I, my title is the Flow Director for Transition and Retirement of the Orbiters. So it's, uh, I have the honor of leading the team that does all the ground processing and preparing these vehicles to be on display and also to transport the vehicles to get them there and get them at their final homes. So it's been a year since Discovery last flew, but now it's sitting there in the mate demate device. What's gone into the last year preparing Discovery to, to go to the uh, Smithsonian? A lot of work has happened. Uh, main thing was to get the vehicles safe for public display. You know, we when we have flight vehicles, we keep them in special processing facilities. You have to have special certifications to even go in those facilities because there's numerous hazards: hypergols, oxidizers, uh, freon, ammonia, and so forth. We had to get all of those commodities off the vehicle to ensure that when it's sitting in the general public and people are up close, there'd be no hazards for them. So that was the, the biggest part of our task. Secondly, was just getting it configured for how the museum wanted to display it. So configuring the payload bay, the crew module and so forth. There's things that, like the, the galley has to come out, you have to reservice it, put it back in, those kind of things. And then lastly, it's just getting it in a position that it's ready to come out here and be made into the 747 and buried. Oh, yeah. So uh, tell us uh, what's going to happen over the next couple of days. Obviously, uh, we're rolled out this morning, but uh, between now and Tuesday, getting the vehicle ready to fly. A lot of work is happening. The uh, main thing is that we're in the main, main device now, and what we're doing is connecting the sling. The sling will allow us to lift the orbiter up high enough that we can retract the landing gear. And we lift it up to 60 feet so we can bring the shuttle carrier aircraft, which is the 747, in underneath the orbiter. And then we lower the orbiter down and connect it to the shuttle carrier aircraft attach points. That's all that we'll be able to do today if things go well. That'll be a full day till about 7 p.m. And that's what we call soft mated. So we're actually connected and, and we're hand tight, but we're not torqued down. Then we'll come in tomorrow morning and use that huge torque multiplier and torque those bolts down fully. Then that allows us to disconnect the sling, raise the sling up, and then we're ready to, to back out of the mate demate device. Now we won't do that tomorrow. We'll wait until Monday morning. But assuming weather's good, first thing Monday morning, we'll back it out. That'll give us a full day to have it out display where the media and the public employees can all come and enjoy it. So, uh, so how different is Discovery now than it was? How much uh, stuff has really been removed from the vehicle? Discovery is a little bit unique when you move from all four vehicles in the sense that Discovery is the vehicle of record. And so we did everything we could to keep it as intact as possible. And that was a, a big desire of the Smithsonian is 100 years from now, if an engineer wants to crawl around and see what it took to fly in space, they can do that. And Discovery would be the vehicle that you would do that with. So we, we minimized things that we took out. There's some things that had to come out. There's certain um, communication boxes that were security reasons that had to come out. There's certain lines that could not. saving a lot more for, for the future programs. So can you talk a little bit about the types of items that you would uh, like to, to keep around? Sure. Um, the main components that we're moving are the, the main propulsion system components in the aft. So in Endeavour and Atlantis, we're basically taking all those components out. You've got big 17-inch feed lines, um, you've got valves, you've got black boxes, uh, you've got all kinds of different lines and things. And the reason they want to take those out is that we can reuse those on the, the current space launch system program, which is underway. So anything that we could save and use saves them time, money, schedule, um, and, and so that allows them to start their program sooner. And so that was the decision in the trade that had to be made is to do that. Now there's other things throughout the entire vehicle that have come out, different avionics boxes that we want to go do um, evaluation on and so forth. Uh, a lot of those things may not be used again, but there's scientific research and things that will be done. Back uh, during the, the final launches, there was a lot of talk about doing autopsies on the vehicles after the after their flying days were over, just to, to, to see how the vehicles had fared, things that hadn't been looked at in 30 years. Uh, as, uh, how has that progressed, and, and are there any results yet? Yeah. Um, there's some things that we have done already. Um, the example would be looking for corrosion. So we went in and did corrosion inspections of the subsurface of the vehicle. So we took off the blankets, took off the tile, and did minute inspections in those areas to see how the airframe has, has survived over time. Um, so that's one example of all that. Now, I am not really involved with any of that forward work, so we basically just collect the data and turn it over, so I can't really tell um, what has been done with that so far, but I'm sure they'll put it to good use. Obviously, you've worked on Discovery for a very long time, so what's your thoughts on uh, seeing her finally leaving now? It, it's, it's mixed emotion because I, I'm very happy that we're to this point. We've worked very hard to get here. Uh, we do have a goal and a task to, to accomplish, and that is to get Discovery to the Smithsonian, and we're all about accomplishing that job. Um, so, so it's a happy feeling in the fact that we're here, we've come this far, but then it's 
I come back and, and I go over to an order processing facility and discovery is not there or the vehicle assembly building where she has been standing for about a month. Uh, I think for me that's when it'll really start to hit me that, that wow, you know, I, I now have to go up to D.C. to see the vehicle that for the past 12 years I could look at on a daily basis. So that'll be difficult. So obviously, uh, you know, the public's going to get a very close to the shuttles now, something they've never been able to do before. What do you hope that the public takes away from that experience when they see them in the museum? I think the biggest thing is, is the outer surface, the thermal protection system, which is so key to the functionality of this vehicle. A lot of people look at it from a distance and it looks like an airplane, so they think about that smooth metal surface. Well, it's, it's completely not like that. And, and even with Enterprise being at the Smithsonian, it has a smooth surface because it, it did not fly in space. So when you see that the contour of the blankets and the tile and the fact that they're not perfectly level and there's gaps between them, I think you'll get a real appreciation of how different an orbiter is from an airplane. Are you going to Dulles and can you talk a little bit about the, the unique uh, mobile crane system that will be used to, to remove the space? I actually just flew back from Dulles yesterday, so our team has been out there for about a month now setting up and preparing. Uh, where we're doing the offload is called Apron W of the Dulles International Airport and it's really out in the middle of the airfield. So for us, we, we, we call it the concrete island because we had to bring everything in that we needed. We had to bring in trailers, generators, lights, computers, chairs, tables, everything um, so that we could set up for this offload activity. Um, we have what we call a wind restraint system that includes four masts with pulleys, tag lines, winches, and so forth that allows us with two heavy lift cranes to be able to lift the orbiter off the 747 without any movement in the lateral positioning. Uh, so very key. Basically that wind restraint system simulates the main demand device you see over my shoulder. It allows us to, to do the offload and then do an onload for Enterprise. So we have we have all of those things in place now. In fact, I just got word this morning that the, the largest of the two cranes is now built up and ready to go. All we have left to do for, to prepare for arrival is we have to build up this sling. So the same sling that you see behind me is, is up there right now being assembled today and tomorrow. Monday we will actually do a dry run. So we will exercise the cranes, lift the sling up and down to verify the team's ready, procedures are ready, hardware's ready to go. And then on Tuesday when the vehicle arrives, the first thing we do is go prepare discovery for being off limits. We use aerial man lifts, get up to the attach points where the sling will attach, prepare those attach points. And then we'll, what we would do is we'll do a first untorquing of the attachments for those general carrier aircraft. So we won't completely remove them, but we'll, we'll loosen those bolts. Then the following day, Wednesday, is the big day. That's a big 12-hour day of doing the actual offload. And so the whole process is we bring the shuttle carrier aircraft uh, with the orbiter on top of it. Underneath this wind restraint system, the sling is already in the air. We roll it right in, lower the sling down, connect it to the orbiter. At that point, we can fully disconnect from the shuttle carrier aircraft, lift the orbiter up, lift it far enough in that we can get it up and move the, the shuttle carrier aircraft out from underneath it, lower the orbiter down, connect up hydraulics, lower the gear, and then bring the vehicle all the way down to weight on wheels. So that'll take us at least 12 hours. That'll be a long day to do that. If things go well, it'll take 12 hours. Um, at that point, we're ready for the ceremony that happens the next day. The next morning, we'll tow over to the, the Udvar Hazi Center and um, start the, the ceremony activities, and then eventually, at the end of the day, tow Discovery into the space hangar, exactly where Enterprise has been sitting. Um, and then we'll begin the process of preparing Discovery to being left there. So we we'll remove the tail cone, reposition engines, close vent doors, things like that to get it in that final configuration that the Smithsonian wants it to be in. So what else is going to the uh, Smithsonian besides the vehicle? Will there be other auxiliary displays and so forth of other equipment perhaps? Absolutely. Um, uh, Dr. Valerie Neal, who's a curator, has been in the process of, of acquiring what we call artifacts, so things that aren't part of Discovery but have flown in space and done things. So she really has a good plan to, to be able to show the public since they can't go in the vehicle. Um, she's acquiring pieces that they can show externally to give an idea. Plus they've done a lot of um, high-tech video capturing and so forth of the internal components of the vehicle so they can show those as well. Um, the last thing I would emphasize is that she's she's really anxious to show the workforce and, and how we all made this happen and, and, and the team behind these vehicles, not just the fact that it's an incredible, uh, miraculous vehicle, but who, who made that happen? What was it about them that made it special? And, and really was able to, to keep us in space for that long. How involved has your team been with the, 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 the uh, display sites? All of them are kind of displaying in a different fashion. So, uh, you know, lending your expertise of what is possible and perhaps what isn't. And that's exactly right. We we have been consulting with each of the museums uh, for, for a couple years now. So, although we don't have any direct involvement with how they display the, vi the vehicles, we did consult them and, and tell them where we were concerned, if there were things that maybe they needed to do differently. Um, and so fortunately, each one is displaying it a little bit differently. So from the public perspective, just because you go to the Smithsonian and see Discovery doesn't mean you shouldn't go to California and see Endeavor because it's going to be a completely different experience between the two. Uh, so we have worked with them, um, but, but we, we will not, once we've delivered the vehicles, at that point in time we, we turn 
it over to them and it's now their show. And can you just talk a little bit about the unique uh, dis delivery of uh, Endeavor being uh, through the city streets of Los Angeles? Sure, yeah, Endeavor is, is one of the most challenging deliveries that they'll have to do. Now, our responsibility will end once we, well, actually, when we offload Endeavor, we'll load it onto the Overland Transporter, which is actually a transporter that we as NASA owned and used when we would bring vehicles from Palmdale to Edwards back in the 80s. So it is something that we're familiar with. So we will load Endeavor onto that transporter, and at that point, we turn it over to the California Science Center. Now, they have come up with some um, self-propelled, independently moving um, modules that allow them to be able to move in very precise you know, distances and directions as they navigate through the streets. So they've got about 13 miles to navigate through city streets. So they're going to have to bring down telephone poles and street lights and stop signs and, and so forth. And, and actually, there's one point along the way where there's less than an inch between wingtip and wall on each side. So it's going to take them a very long day, and it's going to be very precise along that whole path. Um, but they are up for the challenge. They've been involved and ready for this for a long time. We've been consulting with them and helping them along the way. Um, so it, it'll just be a spectacular parade route is really what it'll turn out to be. So a lot of hard work to make that happen, but I think it's going to be a really neat event for people to see. And then uh, Enterprise uh, uh, gets to Tarada Barge for 30 miles. That's true too, uh, unique on every sense. Um, so once again, Enterprise, when we offload at the at JFK airport, we turn it over to them. We're also going to load onto a transporter type of vehicle for them. It has the same attach points that are on the shuttle carrier aircraft, but they're going to mount them onto their own transporter, somewhat like a flatbed transporter. Um, at that point, we're done, but they will then take it over and, and put it on a barge, secure it down to that barge, barge it down the Hudson River to, to another stopping point, move it onto another barge, and then be able to take it all the way down to the Intrepid Sea Air and Space Museum. Then they've got the task of offloading it from the barge onto the flight deck. So uh, amazing work will have to happen there, too. And once again, Intrepid has been very involved. We've been helping them along the way, consulting them also. And uh, obviously, there's so much excitement about the flyovers and, and so forth. It's planned for, for Discovery's uh, trip. Uh, what about Endeavor? It's, it's going across the country. Expecting similar things? Definitely. We'll definitely have flyovers. Now, they haven't yet set that and they won't set that till very close to the date based on weather and so forth. But they'll, they'll definitely use the same opportunities to allow more of the public to get to see these vehicles before they get back on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you.